Welcome, guys, uh, to the second edition of Grapplers for Christ Australia. Um, today I'm going to be talking about a, a couple of things, but the main thing that um, I want to share with you is some of my story. Last week we heard from Jamie. Uh, he spoke about where Grapplers for Christ has been in the past, um, where it's going in our future, and what drives us, our mission around loving people in the grappling community, uh, gathering them together, and then looking for ways that we can serve each other and serve the broader community through martial arts, through craft, through the blessed state that we are here in the West where we can send away uh, some of our money to places like China and Bali at the moment, Academy of Christus, um, to support people uh, who are in need. That's a visible way of showing our service for the community. But I wanted to begin uh, today by uh, reading from uh, the Bible, one of Jesus' stories, which is the parable of the two sons, um, and it's in Luke 15. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property that is coming to me. And the father divided his property between his two sons. But not many days later, the younger son uh, gathered all he had and he took a journey to a far country. And uh, there he squandered his property in reckless living and he spent everything that his father had given him. After he had spent all that his father had given him, a severe famine came in the country and he was hungry. He began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to some of the locals there to work in the pig fields, feeding the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the scraps that he was giving to these pigs uh, because he was hungry, but no one gave him anything. But then he came to uh, himself, uh, when, he, when he came to his senses, um, he said to himself, how many of my father's men have more than enough bread to eat, but I perish here in this foreign country of hunger? So I should get up off my bum and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Please make me like one of your uh, hired servants. So he arose and started going back to his father's house. But when he was still a long way off, uh, his father saw him and had compassion on this son who had gone away. So he ran out to meet him and embraced him. And the son said to his, said to his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring a robe for this servant. Uh, bring a robe and wrap wash his face and put a ring on his hand and, and shoes on his feet and let's bring in the fattened calf and kill it. Let's celebrate for this son who was dead, uh, this son of mine who was dead is alive again. He was lost and he's found and they began to celebrate. Now the older son was in the field working away he came near to the house and he heard the music and the dancing and the partying that was going on. And he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on here? And the servant said to him, your brother's come home and your father's killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. The older brother, he was angry and he refused to go in. So his dad went out to meet him. He said, look, these many years I've served you, Dad, but all this time you've never given us uh, a fattened calf or a goat to celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, he, you killed the fattened calf for him. Uh, and he said to him, son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. It's a fairly long story, but thanks for indulging me. 
but it centres around three main characters. One is this younger brother who asks for something he never should have asked for. He's wanted this money ahead of time. He's basically said, Dad, I wish you were dead so I can have your money and do with it because I'll be better off investing it than what you are with this uh, farming business thing that you've got going on. And for whatever reason, we don't know, it's not really a lesson in economics, the dad decides to give this son his share of the property. And you think, oh, well, this is going to be good for the son. He's actually going to invest it wisely. You know, he might start a, he's going to be a freelancer. He's going to start up his own little business and he'll be quite profitable and he'll actually help the family, the success. But no, he only waits a couple of days before he heads off with all this cash money that he's got and starts partying. And as listeners, I think we're meant to go, this guy is a fool. He's a tool and a fool. He's given up on his duties and his responsibilities to go about seeking whatever he wants in life. It reminds me of when I was younger and uh, I left home. I left home when I was very young. Uh, unfortunately, like some of you, uh, my family life wasn't all the best father wasn't a great example of a father uh, and nor was my mother. So I left thinking that this would be the way to form my own identity and I got into a lot of trouble and things didn't go well and I ended up in rehab. Um, but through the grace of God, much like this younger son, I was welcomed into God's family, a new family, a new identity, a new sense of purpose. So this younger son isn't quite there yet. He's realising the predicament that he's in, and so he makes up this speech about what he's going to say to his dad when he gets back there. You know, I've really screwed up. I realise I can't come back into the family and just be part of the business again. You're probably going to have to make me like uh, one of the employees. Um, and so he makes up this speech, and he heads back home. But dad doesn't even let the speech get out of the son's mouth before the son is welcomed in and he's put fresh new clothes on and they have a big party because their son is back. And part of it as hearers is we're meant to thinking, well, where's the justice in this? Because he's gone out, he's squandered all of dad's money, or half of it at least, um, and he's been not wise with it and he's come back and the father's welcomed him. Now, in our society, dads are expected to be a bit forgiving, aren't they? They're expected, you know, it's your son, you welcome him back. And yet, in the times when Jesus is telling this story, this would be too much shame and too much dishonour to welcome in a son who's been so wayward and so extravagant and he's been hanging around with pigs, which for Jewish people is not really a done thing. Uh, it's not kosher at all, literally, not kosher. Um, but nevertheless, the father celebrates this son, welcoming back. And part of what we see in this picture, that Jesus is telling us, is that that's what God, our father, is like. Regardless of where we've been or what we've done, that he is keen, he is ready to run out to meet people who have walked away from him, who have never known him. He's ready to embrace them. Unlike what a father would have done in Jesus' day, there would have been shame and dishonour. The son never would have been welcomed back. God the Father welcomes him with open arms. God the Father puts on a great feast to celebrate this son who's returned, which is stupid to our minds because he's done the wrong thing. Gee, God welcomes him back in. This father welcomes him back in. He is a true father. But we're left with the problem of this older son. It comes in right at the end of the story. It's almost like an anecdote, isn't it? Like we've heard the main juicy part where this, where this son's gone off and he's had wild livings and he's been sleeping with hookers and drinking beer and having a great time. We think that's the main part of the story because it takes up most of the passage. But in actual fact, the main part of the story is this older son who's left out outside. And, you know, I can relate to this older son. About six years ago, um, I was studying at uh, Ridley with, um, with Guy Mason, my pastor now, and um, within about the first year of studying at this Bible college, I thought, 
this could be what God is calling me to do. He's calling me to work full time in ministry. And so I, I did the thing that you would do is I sought counsel from other people that I was going to church with, family, friends, uh, my pastors, um, trying to discern, is this the right next step for me? And we, de we determined that it was. So uh, I continued on with this, this training for about five years of making sure that my marks were up to, up to scratch and uh, being out in churches on placement, learning about how to be a minister, how to be a pastor. And the hope was that at the end of this five years, I'd be ordained. One of our friends from uh, Sydney on the Hill uh, got ordained a couple of weeks ago, uh, which is a big step for people that are doing study. In some ways, it's a bit like when you've finished your medical degree and they finally give you a license to practice. Um, and so I thought, well, I've ticked all the boxes, I've done all the things that I should do, and it didn't happen. At the very last hurdle of this, this race that I've been running for five years, um, I got the news that I wasn't suitable in, uh, for, for ordination. I wasn't going to be priesthood. And I was like, say what? Five years I've been doing this. I've done all the steps that I was meant to do and I've attended all the things that I've been doing. This was what is coming to me. Yes, this is my reward. I get to be ordained and I get to go out and work in ministry because I've done the things that you're meant to do. But it didn't happen. I was indignant. I was furious. These five years of my life I've spent studying and working and being nice to people who I didn't want to be nice to and caring for people until it made my heart break with tears. I mean, I remember for a year I was working in the hospital which, uh, as a chaplain, which was an awesome job because um, you get to be beside people as they're going through really challenging things in their life, health concerns, uh, family breakdown because of, uh, because of the stress that death or, or sickness can bring about on people. I'm, and I get, to, I get to be a part of these people's lives. Like they share things with me that, that they would never share with not even their family, like their fears and such a privileged position. And you'd also left me with a sense of hollowness and emptiness because while I got to hear these secrets from people, these fears and concerns that they have, which many of you, if you've been in positions of leadership, you know that people come to you to share their lives with you, to ask you questions. It's a great privilege. But I had nobody to go home to and do this with. I had my family and they bore the cost of that. But I, where was my person to, to, to talk to about the issues that I was having, like these patients had with me? I didn't have that. And so when I got told that there was no longer an option for me to go ahead with full-time ministry and to be ordained, I was disappointed. A little bit like this older brother. All these years I've worked for you, Dad, and yet you've never even given me a little goat to celebrate with my brothers. Like you could you could resonate that with that, couldn't you? I've done all the right things. I've been all the things that I'm meant to be, and yet where's my reward? Why can't I get what this younger son is getting? The brother, older brother in this story hasn't got the wisdom that he should have had the same attitude that the father had. What did the father do when he sees the son coming far off? Runs out to meet him. Despite all the norms and mores, the do's and don'ts of how things should have been in that ancient society, this father says to blow with the, to blow with the rules, I'm running out to meet my son. So this time where the younger son was away, what was the older son doing? Sitting at home, ticking the boxes. Why hadn't he gone out to find his younger brother? To say, come back home. I needed an older brother at that time in my life where things turned. I had an attitude like the older brother, but I didn't have somebody to run out to me. And I was fortunate that at a men's camp, Andrew, who has uh, been a part of Renegade for a long time, uh, uh, invited me along just to come and do some weights at the back. Andrew was an unlikely character. He was 
rough around the edges, a heart of gold, a warm and honest guy who told it like it is. Sometimes that ruffled, ruffled people's, people's feathers, but he had the heart to come out and ask me to come and join something, come out and seek me where I was and bring me into a community like this, a community like Renegade. And through uh, this community, that's shaped by Grapplers for Christ, uh, I found a home, a safe space where I could begin to grow and develop again. And maybe that's where some of you are at. Maybe you look for a home or a refuge, a place where you can grow. Not because of keeping all the rules or being a renegade, but because you're part of the family of God. So regardless of how well you tick the Christian boxes, or if you refuse to tick any of them at all, you can be part of this family, this community of Christians who grapple. Not because of certificates that you have on the wall or because of belts that you have on your gi, but because of Jesus. Because he runs out to meet you. He runs out to welcome you and bring you home. But you might not be the person who's in need of rescue. You might be like the older brother, who every time somebody new comes in, and I know I've done it, somebody new comes in, got a big tap out t-shirt on, and you think, oh my goodness, this is going to be terrible rolling with this person. Or you see a white belt who is just beginning their journey, and you see them, and they use, they use all their strength. None of their technique. It's almost a, it's in every gym that you go to. It's part of the jiu-jitsu journey. They are running like sprinters at the start of a marathon. They don't know any different. It's easy for us to sit there, particularly when we're training for a while, to sit there and go, this guy's a muppet. I'm not going to roll with him. Or, did you see so-and-so there doing that move? What? That's not the right move to do. And when I do that, you know who I am? I'm that older brother again. Not bothering to go over and engage with the guy, ask him how he's going, maybe even show him the right way to do a hip escape, for example. I'm that older brother. I think as a community, we want to be people in our gyms, in our homes, in our workplaces, where we're the true older brother that acts like that frivolous and crazy dad that races out to welcome and embrace people that come into our doors, glad that you're here, glad that you're a part of this community. Not because you have a black belt and are a world champion, uh, or because you're particularly strong or gifted, or but because you walked in that door, and that was enough for you to belong here, walking in the door. Guys, let me uh, close with uh, prayer. Um, and then we're going to have an open mat. Father, thank you that uh, we come to you with um, our lives as they are, and we ask you to accept us. Whether we have our lives together and are kicking goals, or whether sometimes things just aren't fitting together. We ask that you'd give us the grace and peace that we need, the friends and family that provide us support, and the courage to come back again and again. We thank you that you call us a family. We thank you that you've raced out to meet us in Jesus. And we thank you that now our part in this family isn't based on how good or how bad we are but it's based on your loving acceptance of us. Please help us to live that out in our places where we do work, where we do life, where we minister, where we grapple. Please teach us to be like that true older brother who welcomes people regardless of their stripes or their belts or their proficiency or whether we think they're going to uh, click with them. Please open our hearts to be a community of Christians who grapple. In Jesus' name, Amen.